All right, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can you get, hear me okay? All right. Welcome on this snowy afternoon in Seattle. It's very fun. Um, we are very delighted to have Dr. John Kane with us here today for our Grand Rounds. Um, Dr. Kane is Senior Vice President for Behavioral Health Services at Northwell Health in New York. He is a professor and chairman of psychiatry at the Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. He also serves as chairman of psychiatry at the Zechary Hillside Hospital in Glen Oaks, New York. Um, Dr. Kane is a recipient, recipient of many awards, including, but not limited to, the Lieber Prize, the a APA's Kemp Award, and the New York State Office of Mental Health Lifetime Achievement Award. Most recently, and he'll talk about this today, Dr. Kane has served as PI on the NIMH-funded Recovery After Initial Episode, Initial Schizophrenia Episode Early Treatment Program, or RAISE ETP study, which tested a team-based coordinated specialty care program now called Navigate. It's also noteworthy to know that Navigate was the adopted model of coordinated specialty care that we are using right here in Washington State right now. So we're really excited to have you, Dr. Kane. Please welcome him now. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's very exciting to hear about your plans for a first episode program. And it's a, it's obviously a very it's a, a time very timely topic. And as I'll emphasize, I think when we focus on the first episode of any illness, it's really where the patient and family experience begins. So it's very important that we convey the right messages. Um, it's also very important that we get the treatment right because that can have an impact on what happens down the road. So keep that in mind as, as we go through some of this. Uh, first, my disclosures, I've been a consultant to most of the major pharmaceutical companies involved in developing antipsychotic drugs. I'm particularly interested in the design and conduct of clinical trials. And let me start off by saying that one of the biggest challenges that we have in, the, in mental health is the fact that most individuals who experience a mental illness or an addictive disorder do not get any treatment for a very long time, years. So on this slide, we see some data suggesting that those people with panic disorder takes a, a median of 10 years before they get into treatment, major depressive disorder, eight years, bipolar disorder, six years, and even in schizophrenia, as we'll talk about in a moment, the median was a year and a half. And so one of our biggest challenges is to try to reduce the duration of untreated illness because there are lots of data suggesting that the longer that someone goes untreated, the more difficult it is to get the optimum outcome. There are many reasons why people don't receive treatment. There are structural barriers, People feel they can handle their problems on their own. They do not want to seek professional help. There's still a lot of stigma associated with psychiatric illness in, in many cases, so people are hesitant to acknowledge that they're having these kinds of problems. So in the case of schizophrenia, these are um, data from a number of different studies suggesting that the mean duration of untreated psychosis in studies from different countries around the world was at least a year. These are data from the RAID study that was referred to in the introduction. I'll be talking about that in greater detail. But this study involved the recruitment of 404 first episode patients at 34 community clinics in 21 different states across the US. The average age of this population was 23. When we examined the median duration of untreated psychosis, so that's the time between the onset of psychotic symptoms and someone actually receiving treatment, the median was a year and a half. This is a paper published by Gene Addington um, recently. So why are we concerned about delayed treatment? Well, if you think about someone experiencing psychotic signs and symptoms and not getting any treatment, we have uh, decrement in functioning, loss of educational opportunities, impaired psychosocial and vocational development. Since this is an illness which usually begins in late adolescence or early adulthood, it's a critical time for people's uh, development, psychosocially, vocationally, et cetera. Tremendous personal suffering and family burden. The families are often unsure what to do. They don't know what's going on. And then potential poor response even once treatment is provided. So 
We're going to come back to the issue of duration of untreated psychosis. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the things that we're doing uh, with social media and the internet to try to address this problem. But first, we're going to talk about the treatment of first episode schizophrenia. So this implies people have already presented for treatment. Recovery is a major goal for the treatment of any illness. In schizophrenia, how do we define recovery? Well, on the slide in front of you, the group at UCLA, Bob Liberman and Alex Kapelowitz, suggested that recovery should be sustained in four different domains for two years in order for someone to be considered truly recovered, symptom remission, role function, ability to perform day-to-day -day living tasks, and um, social interactions with people outside of the immediate family, again, sustained for at least two years. The role function could be part-time, could be being a homemaker, what have you, but some evidence of um, successful role function. When we applied these criteria to a population of first episode patients that we were following at Zucker Hillside Hospital, where I work, uh, there are 104 patients involved in this five-year follow-up, and we found that only 14% of patients met the UCLA recovery criteria at the end of five years of treatment. And that was disappointing because we'd like to think that this is a, this is a, a clinic with a lot of well-trained um, uh, staff. And then interestingly, subsequent to that, Erica Jaskalainen in Finland published a systematic review and meta-analysis of recovery in schizophrenia, looking at all of the research that had been done over the last several decades. And she came up with the exact same number, 14% of people meeting recovery criteria across a wide range of studies, including first episode and more chronic individuals. And what was particularly disappointing is she found that the rates of recovery had really not improved very much over the last several decades. So that suggests that we have a lot of work to do. And that's a background for the RAISE project. So RAISE stands for Recovery After Initial Schizophrenia Episode. Our project was the Early Treatment Program. There was also a project funded at Columbia. I understand Lisa Dixon will be visiting with you in a couple of weeks, and she'll be, I'm sure we'll talk about the RAISE Connection Program. Uh, so NIMH funded uh, these two projects. Ours was the one that actually involved a large randomized controlled trial. And that's, those are the data that I'm going to be sharing with you. So um, this was a, a contract with the National Institute of Mental Health. I was fortunate to be the principal investigator, but we assembled a team of experts in psychopharmacology, psychosocial treatment, family, uh, family treatment, uh, health economics, uh, even anthropology. And uh, this is the executive leadership team. We worked very closely with Bob Heinzen, who's really the father of this project. Um, and uh, his, his colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health were very involved in, in this project um, uh, throughout uh, the conduct. And in fact, we are still following uh, some of these patients because we are following people for up to five years and we have not reached that time point yet for everyone. Uh, this is a quote from a poem by Yeats and I, to me it, it kind of um, summarizes what a young person is, is, is facing when they're confronted with a diagnosis of a psychotic disorder or schizophrenia. So this was kind of our motto. The specified aims of RAISE, and it was very clear what the National Institute of Mental Health wanted. They wanted us to develop a comprehensive and integrated intervention to promote recovery, not just symptomatic recovery, but functional recovery. But very importantly, to be capable of being delivered in real world settings, utilizing current funding mechanisms. So that means in community mental health centers who are not getting additional research funding. And this is a very important, a very important uh, element of what we did because you, you can uh, develop an intervention in a research or academic clinic with a lot of uh, extra staff, a lot of trainees. That's very different from developing an intervention that can be delivered to people across the United States in community mental health centers no matter where they are. Obviously, reimbursement in, the, in this country is complicated, and community mental health center, centers rely on different streams of revenue. The only area where we did provide some supplementation was to ensure that there was a supportive employment, supportive education specialist available, because some clinics did not have access to any such specialist. So we provided at least five hours a week of support, which is not enough by any means, but it was at least um, a minimum. 
And then once we develop that intervention, and we did this by consulting with experts around the world and by reviewing the literature and coming up with an intervention that we thought was evidence-based but also feasible, uh, once we did that, the idea was to implement that into a large controlled clinical trial to determine whether or not coordinated specialty care in this model would actually have an impact on outcome. So those were the challenges. So how do you, how do, you do this? Well, it's, it's, very, it's very tricky to set up a controlled trial, uh, a research controlled trial in clinics that are not accustomed to doing research. And I said one of our first mandates was to do this in real world settings. So these are clinics that do not, do not have investigators to do structured diagnostic research interviews or rating scales, et cetera, et cetera. They're not accustomed to doing research. So one thing we did was to use um, live two-way video and a cadre of centralized assessors who did all of the diagnostic interviews and all of the major uh, outcome assessments. So they could be kept blind to the treatment assignment because this is essentially a psychosocial treatment study. They were blind to the treatment assignment. In fact, they were blind to the design of the overall trial. But also they were trained. They were trained raters who were accustomed to doing these research interviews and these research rating instruments. So that's how we, we combine sort of the, the best of research uh, skill and technology with the, the concept of working in real world community mental health centers. So we, we did what's called cluster randomization. That means we had 34 clinics, 17 were randomized to deliver the enhanced intervention, which we, we called Navigate, and that is coordinated specialty care. 17 clinics were randomized to do what they usually do. The clinics did not know, of course, to which they would be randomized when they signed up for this. We were very fortunate these clinics were highly motivated. None of them dropped out after learning that they were randomized to be in the control group. So 404 uh, individuals between the ages of 15, uh, 15 and 40 who met uh, schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis and had less than six months total cumulative exposure to antipsychotic medication. Average age was 23 and a half, predominantly Caucasian. Uh, most of the patients were neither working nor going to school at baseline and about 80% had come out of a hospital. So their first episode in many cases led to a hospitalization. All right, so what is Navigate? Navigate is the, is the, tr is the treatment, uh, coordinated specialty care. It's team-based, and that's, that's a critical. It's easy to say team. It's much more difficult to actually implement it. Team meetings are not necessarily reimbursed if you're running a clinic on a, a relatively uh, um, difficult, in difficult sort of revenue circumstances. That a team meeting might be the first thing to go because you, can't, you don't have any revenue associated with that. Yet it's extremely important to actually have face-to-face -face conversations about the patients that you're treating. Shared decision-making, a, fo a focus on strength and resiliency, not symptoms and, and weaknesses. Psychoeducational teaching skills, motivation and enhancement, collaboration with natural supports in the community. There are four key components. The first is psychopharmacology. For that, we developed a computerized decision support system that we called COMPASS. And, and there's a paper that's just appearing in the American Journal of Psychiatry this month uh, Delbert Robinson is the first author, which describes some of the data with the COMPASS uh, program, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The uh, second key component is, is individual therapy, which we called individual resiliency training. The third component is family psychoeducation and family therapy, and the fourth compo component is supported education and supported employment. So each one of these is manualized. The manuals are available on our website, which is raiseetp.org. I recommend them to, to those of you who are gonna be involved in starting the first episode program here. Uh, they're, they're extremely helpful uh, manuals. There's also a manual for the team leader. So this is uh, the paper that's uh, just published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. The computerized decision support system did a number of things. It provided evidence-based guidance to the prescribers as to optimal treatment decisions and shared decision making, but it also gave the patients an opportunity to fill out self-assessment questionnaires on both symptoms and side effects before they walked into the doctor's office. That would be fed into the doctor's computer so he or she would have on their screen in front of them when the patient walked into the room what they had endorsed or not endorsed in terms of side effects and symptoms and would give them reminders and pop-ups to say you need to follow up on this. The clinicians would also be asked to fill out their own assessment of the patient 
And this was the kind of uh, measurement-based decision-making. Some of the impact that we saw from this computerized decision support system, for example, was that the patients who had the benefit of that ended up receiving fewer prescriptions for antidepressants, yet, as you'll see in a minute, their scores on the depression outcome measures were better. So we think that some of the people were getting, getting antidepressants unnecessarily, and that what they really needed was psychosocial intervention. That's one example. Um, other differences we saw that the Navigate, uh, the Navigate participants experienced fewer side effects. They also gained less weight. So there were other positive impacts from the, from the uh, computerized decision support system. So what about outcomes? So we, we trained the staff in those clinics that were randomized to deliver Navigate. The other clinics just did what they usually do with no supervision from us. One of the first findings is that those patients who participated in Navigate stayed in treatment longer. So working with first episode patients is a real challenge because they don't want to stay in treatment. So this was uh, a very valuable advantage. We also saw an advantage in terms of the percent of these young people with any work or school days per month as we followed them over the ensuing two years. The data I'm sharing with you, by the way, are the initial two years of follow-up. And this is based, I think, uh, on the supportive employment, supportive education model. So having a specialist working with the young person to help them get back to school or get a job and then keep the job or stay in school is very important. That's a specialty unto itself. And if anything, we didn't have enough of that, even though we provided some supplemental support for those clinics that didn't have any such uh, expertise. The Navigate patients did better in terms of the PANS total score. The PANS is the rating scale that we use for psychopathology and schizophrenia. They did better on the Calgary Depression Scale for schizophrenia, despite getting fewer prescriptions for antidepressant drugs. And our primary outcome measure was uh, the Heinrichs Carpenter Quality of Life Scale. So in many clinical trials, people look at symptoms or relapse or hospitalization rates. Our primary outcome measure was quality of life, which is a it's a, it's a lengthy interview that covers a, lots of different domains. And we saw that th those patients receiving Navigate did better in terms of quality of life. However, duration of untreated psychosis uh, had an important impact on that. So those people with a duration of untreated psychosis less than 74 weeks, which is the median, were significantly more likely to benefit from the coordinated specialty care than those people at a longer duration of untreated psychosis. So that emphasizes the need to try to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, which is an enormous challenge, and we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Now, I should, one caveat though, is even though we've seen this relationship between the duration of untreated psychosis and outcome, it doesn't necessarily tell us that if we reduce the duration of untreated psychosis that the outcome's gonna get better. That's something we have to prove. One area where we did not see a difference, which was somewhat disappointing, was hospitalization rates. So these young people who had had one episode of psychosis, over the ensuing two years, one out of every three was hospitalized or re-hospitalized. The proportion in the control group was 37%. The proportion in the experimental navigate group was 34%, so a non-significant difference. We were hoping that Navigate would be associated with a reduction in the risk of hospitalization. Um, it did obviously, uh, it did su uh, superior on a number of other variables, which you've or we've already talked about, which are very important. But hospitalization is a cost driver. Uh, it's also something that can be very traumatic to people, and we really were hoping we would reduce that. So this leads to questions, of course, well, why, why first are one out of every three people hospitalized? And um, what could we do to try to reduce that further? Turns out that, that that rate is actually pretty low. If you look at comparable studies, the first episode patients done around, done around the world, these rates are, even in the control group, these rates are actually pretty low. And we think that the control sites, even though they were not delivering Navigate, they were pretty motivated. We think they did a pretty good job of keeping people out of the hospital. One of the first questions when we look at hospitalization and relapse is what were people taking their medication? What role does non-adherence play in the risk of rehospitalization? Plays a huge role. At the same time, there are people who are still questioning the need for antipsychotic medication, particularly following 
a first episode of schizophrenia. This is some of the debate that we've been having for a very long time. One of the first studies that I ever published in 1982 was actually a placebo controlled study of relapse prevention in first episode patients. And we showed that drug was superior to placebo in terms of preventing relapse. Many years later, th this debate is still going on. Um, and the slide in front of you is from a meta-analysis that Stefan Loik published in 2012. And um, this meta-analysis is a systematic review and meta-analysis of relapse prevention studies in schizophrenia where drug was compared to placebo. The number needed to treat here is three. So that is as good as it gets in medicine in general. So this is a very powerful effect in my opinion, something that we really should not be debating. The question becomes, how long does the medication need to be continued? And are there some people who might not need the medication? Yes, there probably are, but it's a very, very small percentage. And at this point, we have no way to identify a subgroup of people that might represent, you know, five or 10% of a population. So one of the challenges is how do we get, young people who may not have fully accepted that they even have an illness, who do not want to take medication, who may experience side effects from the medication, how do we get them to continue to take medication in such a way to reduce the risk of hospitalization. In the Ray study, we did not have any fancy measures of adherence. We did not do blood levels or pill counts. We did have uh, a three item question called the adherence estimator, which essentially asked the patients about his or her attitude towards taking medication. There was a relationship between the response on those questions and hospitalization. So we do believe that adherence played a role in the risk for hospitalization. One strategy to reduce the risk of non-adherence is using long-acting injectable medication. Yet they are gross, in my opinion, they're grossly underutilized in the United States. This slide is from a meta-analysis that we published three years ago in Schizophrenia Bulletin, where we looked at the randomized controlled trials comparing, I'm gonna use the abbreviation LAI for long-acting injectable. We compared LAIs to oral medication um, in a, looking at a number of trials. And actually, we did not see a significant difference, particularly in some of the more recent studies. And although we think that the randomized controlled trial is the gold standard, when we're studying something like adherence, actually going into a trial changes things, changes the ecology of care, changes many things. So that the, this, it may not be the gold standard in this uh, circumstance, although we are now conducting a large simple trial comparing LAIs to usual care in early phase and first episode patients across the country at about 40 different clinics using cluster randomization. We've entered 496 patients into this project. And it's a large simple trial in the sense that we are interfering very little with the treatment. We are not doing frequent assessments. We are not doing reminders. It's, it's a very much hands-off a uh, large simple trial. So this, this may be an opportunity to do an actual RCT that does not interfere with care the way many RCTs do. We'll see what the results are. So another way to look at the impact of LAIs is the so-called mirror image study. And what do we mean by that? If someone's taking oral medicine and then you switch them to injections, you compare, let's say a year or two years before the switch with a year or two years after the switch. That's where the mirror image comes in. So each person is his or her own control. And in all of this, this is a meta-analysis that we published uh, four years ago in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, where we reviewed all of the mirror image studies. These, the advantage for the LAIs was highly significant. One of the challenges to this, though, is there are other uh, possibilities when you look at mirror image. Maybe the number of beds in that community went down over the period of those four years. So that's why people had fewer hospitalizations or maybe it got harder to get people into a hospital because the insurance company was being much more, uh, much more strict. So there are relatively few uh, studies that went in the other direction, taking people who are on LAIs and then switching them to oral medicine, but there have been a couple. Here's one that was published two years ago um, where patients were switched from uh, injectable risperidone 
to injectable paliperidone or from injectable risperidone to oral medication. And those people who went from the injections to the oral had a significant increase in the rate of hospitalization. So that's the reverse of what's usually done, but again, supports the impact of long-acting injectable drugs. A third way to study this is the so-called naturalistic or cohort study. And what that means is you go into a large database or large national registry. This has been done particularly in countries like Finland and Sweden, where they have national registries. And you look at all of those individuals who are receiving long-acting injectable medicine, all of those individuals who are receiving perhaps even the same drug orally, and you see whether or not there are differences in rates of hospitalization. Now, that's not random assignment, right? It's naturalistic. But if you have a large enough database, you can do some propensity matching. You can try to match different subgroups on relevant variables. And this is a meta-analysis that we're still in the middle of doing, but we believe that the cohort studies show a very significant advantage for the long-acting injectable medicines in terms of number of hospitalizations per person year, and also in terms of all-cause discontinuation, favoring the LAIs. Now, some of the best studies of this type have been done by uh, Yari Tahonen, who's currently at the Karolinska, using, again, the Finnish and Swedish national registries. And in this study, he focused on 2,500 people hospitalized for the very first time for schizophrenia in Finland. And what he found is that about half of the patients were not even taking their medication during the first few months after discharge. But he also found, and that's one of the challenges for you folks as you develop your first episode program, he also found that those people getting long-acting injectable medicine had a significantly lower risk of rehospitalization than those people getting oral medicine, even within the same drug. Also showed that um, clozapine was associated with a reduction in risk of hospitalization. And we'll talk about clozapine a little bit later. This is a study that was done at UCLA, um, published uh, two years ago by uh, Ken Subotnik. Uh, 30, I'm sorry, 86 patients, first episode patients, were randomly assigned to long-acting risperidone versus oral risperidone. And you see the difference. The risk of relapse was 33% in the orally treated patients and 5% in the LAI treated patients, a very significant difference. Now, again, not every RCT shows this kind of effect. This was particularly impressive because it was first episode patients. And also, uh, George Bartsakis uh, published data suggesting that those patients, again, first episode patients who got the long acting injectable medicine had greater increases in cortical myelination during the follow-up period than those patients getting oral medication. This is, a, this is a complicated finding. We're trying to replicate it in a study we're doing right now, but it's very interesting. If actually the injections are associated with um, better changes in brain morphology, cortical myelination, myelinization is a good thing. Um, if they're associated with, with positive changes in brain morphology, that's, that's very interesting. We have to understand why that is. Next, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> The next thing I want to talk about for a minute is biomarkers. And this is another, this is a, a gap in the field right now. Um, we are in, in, in real need of predictors of, you know, who's going to respond to medication, who's not going to respond to medication, who's going to develop certain side effects, who's not going to develop those side effects. One of, one of the strategies that we've been very interested in is the so-called early non-response strategy. And that means identifying those people who after two weeks of treatment, this is for an acute exacerbation, say hospitalized individuals, those people who after two weeks of treatment do not even have minimal benefit from the antipsychotic medication they're taking. That's not a good sign. That is a pretty powerful predictor of a, of a bad subsequent uh, treatment course. And this is a, uh, the slide is from a meta-analysis that was published two years ago by Stefan Loik's group, uh, showing uh, from 34 different studies that this has held up pretty well. The problem, of course, is if you have someone after two weeks who has not had at least minimal response, what do you do? And we don't have a good answer to that, because some clinicians will raise the dose, some clinicians will switch to a different drug, some will uh, add a second drug. The only thing that you know, I would say we could feel pretty confident of is going to clozapine. 
but we're not likely to go to clozapine after two weeks, after a failure on one drug for two weeks. Although we, would, we think that's something that really should be studied. Another biomarker that we're very excited about is resting state MRI. These are data from uh, uh, Deepak Sarpal when he was at Hillside, published two years ago. And, and this is um, basically using MRI uh, to measure stradal connectivity and showing that um, antipsychotic drugs, when the patient responds, were associated with improvements in stradal connectivity as measured on MRI. And then in another data set, he also reported that the baseline stradal functional con connectivity was a predictor of response. So it changed in correlation with the antipsychotic drug response, but it was also a predictor of response at baseline. Now this needs to be replicated, but if it holds up, it could serve as a biomarker to help us identify those people who are more or less likely to benefit from an antipsychotic drug trial. Clozapine. So this is a paper that, uh, that I published in 1988. Um, one of my a friend was teaching this to some residents, and one of the residents asked if he was still alive. So I said, he said, he said barely, but anyway. Um, so this, this was a study that um, we did that led to the FDA approving clozapine for the treatment of treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Subsequently, it also has an indication for suicidality. Um, 30 years later, however, we are still debating and this is a meta-analysis that was published last year, again, by Stefan Leuk's group, um, who do some of the best meta-analyses that we, we see in psychiatry, and, and Stefan is a dear friend. Um, but let me read you a sentence from the conclusion. Uh, At present, insufficient <coughs> blinded evidence exists on which antipsychotic is more efficacious for patients with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Right. So this is 30 years after the paper that I just shared with you. And it's not a question of whether clozapine is superior or not, it's a question that we still are debating it. It's like, how is this possible 30 years later that we're still having this debate? That is an incredible indictment of our field. And you know, there are, I would say, if, you know, if you're asking, well, who's, who's at fault there? There are lots, of, lots of different uh, issues. And a lot of it has to do with the trial, the way the trials were done. So, there's nothing wrong with this meta-analysis. It's extremely well done. The problem are the trials that went into the meta-analysis. Some of them are not so well done. And we really have to, um, I think, have a much better understanding of when clozapine works, when it doesn't work. But in my opinion, anyone who has treatment-resistant schizophrenia deserves a trial of clozapine. And unfortunately, that's not happening. And I have a, a series of slides here just pointing out that there are data from other sources besides randomized controlled trials. This is a, a paper that Scott Stroop published in the American Journal, well, sorry, American Journal of Psychiatry two years ago, looking again at a Medicaid database of so several thousand patients showing superiority of clozapine in terms of uh, reducing the risk of hospitalization, in terms of reducing the risk of antipsychotic drug discontinuation. <laughs> this is another study from uh, the Swedish National Registry, Yari Tahonen, almost 30,000 patients. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but one of the things that he showed was a significant effect of clozapine in terms of the risk of hospitalization, as well as long-acting injectable drugs, yet again. So one of the problems in this whole area of treatment-resistant schizophrenia is the, re the research that we're doing is just not good enough. So we published this paper uh, in the American Journal last year. This is a work group that we put together to discuss uh, criteria and guidelines for doing research in treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And one of the things that we found is there were 42 randomized controlled trials that met our criteria for review. Half of them did not provide operationalized criteria for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And only two of them used the same criteria. So that's just one sort of window into the fact that we are not doing trials well enough. And the hope is that this publication will encourage people to, to use operational criteria to be more careful in how they're doing the research. So in